Today's chapel is part two in a three-part series on the theme of the sanctity of human life. And in this series, we are considering various dimensions of life issues, specifically as related to the complex and challenging topic of abortion. In December, Dr. Vince Baycoat of our Bible department addressed biblical and theological dimensions of abortion. And in April, Dr. Charmaine Yost will speak to the matter of public policy. Today, we will be hearing from Nancy Cruiser, who will be speaking from a personal and experiential side of the issue. By the way, I want to thank members of the Voice for Life Club on campus for their ongoing care and concerns in all of the ways that they provide education and advocacy. For quite a few years now, this campus organization has faithfully encouraged a Christian and compassionate response to the issues of life and abortion. Our chapel guest, Nancy Cruiser, lives locally and is a member of the Church of the Resurrection here in Wheaton. She serves as the Illinois Regional Coordinator for the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. Her ministry reaches out to people who have been hurt by abortion. This morning, Nancy will be sharing her personal story. I've heard her story, and I believe that you will be helped and encouraged by her message. Please welcome Nancy Cruiser. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Today I'm here to tell you the story of my abortion, but it is first and foremost a story of the goodness and mercy of a loving God. This is a story of the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. This is a story of a redeemed life. I am a follower of Jesus Christ, but it has not always been so and was not at the time of my abortion. I know what it is to walk without the Lord. I know what it is, praise God, to walk with him. So why am I here today to talk about abortion why am I here to tell you my story? There seems to be a great silence around abortion, wouldn't you say? Perhaps even more so in Christ's church. And as I've thought about this, I've thought that Christians often seem confused, overwhelmed, divided even around the issues of abortion. I've also recognized a different kind of silence, and it looks like shame. In my own healing with the Lord, I explored with his help what it means to discover that there is no shame in Christ Jesus in regards to my abortion, but I have seen something entirely different in so many others. On several occasions, men, yes, men, and women have approached me cautiously, and they have whispered the secrets of their abortions in my ears. Secrets, whispers. I just sensed suffering in so many, and it was easy to understand this and to empathize because the silence around my own abortion had lasted almost 20 years. So why talk about abortion again? The evil one likes to confuse. The evil one lies. Silence is a powerful weapon of the enemy because it's in silence that the truth remains hidden. Lies flourish in silence. Lies that justify the killing of unborn children and lies that say that abortion does not hurt people. 55 million unborn children have lost their lives in this country alone due to abortion since 1973 when abortion became legal in this country. 
It is the greatest civil rights issue of our day. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And so I began to ask myself, as a Christian, what is required of me? Now, one more thing before I get on with my story. Do we have a stereotype of who gets abortions? Because if we study the numbers, we quickly discover that abortion spares no one. Younger, older, married, non-married, Christian, non-Christian, all races, all cultures, all socioeconomic levels. One out of three women have had an abortion. This means that they ride with us on trains and buses. We pass them in grocery stores. They're in our circle of friends. They sit in the pews of our churches. We know, do we not, that abortion is not merely a statistic. It's not merely a number. Abortion is about people. It is about the babies, yes, of course, but it is about the mothers and the fathers and the sisters and the brothers and the grandparents even. It is about all who have been touched by and wounded by the tragedy of abortion. And so it seems evident to me that our whole culture has been wounded by abortion, all of us, whether we've had an abortion ourselves. So what have we lost? Who have we lost? You might want to look around you today because one out of four of you is not here. Now I have often asked myself, what could have altered the events that led up to my abortion? What could anyone have said to me? What could anyone have shown me that might have changed my mind? I have asked, how is it that I, I was a mother of a two-year-old. I was a good mother, a loving mother, a mother who understood what it was to deeply love a child. How could I so calculatingly agree to end the life of a baby I already knew? This was a baby I could feel moving in my womb. This was a baby with eyelashes and eyebrows and fingernails grown to the ends of her fingertips. This was a baby old enough to distinguish my voice. This was a baby who could feel pain. These are all questions that I have asked. Now the story of my abortion is a little bit different than some, although there are commonalities and one is that I deeply regret my abortion. And the other is that the scars from my abortion were devastating and long-lasting. My baby was 22 weeks, so I was five and a half months pregnant when an ultrasound revealed edema about the head that's water on the brain. I was lying on the table I could hear the heartbeat of my baby resounding in the examining room. When all of a sudden the technician just shut down the machine, excused herself and abruptly left the room. She returned a few minutes later with the doctor who told me that my baby was sick. I would later find out that she had Down syndrome. He then recommended terminating the pregnancy. Now from that point on, my baby was no longer referred to as a baby. Instead, I heard language such as lethal pregnancy or um, fetus. And in regards to his recommendation, I heard empty the contents of the womb or termination of the pregnancy. You see, the distortion in language was the sign that the kind of care that my baby and I had been receiving was drastically changing. The doctor told me that termination would be a simple procedure, that I could put all of this behind me, I could get on with my life and try for another pregnancy. 
I want you to know that I never questioned his advice. Why not? Perhaps it was because he was my trusted caregiver. Perhaps it was because he was the authority figure. But I do not mean to imply that I was not complicit here. Perhaps I did suspect the horrifying, I mean, really horrifying reality of what I was agreeing to. But I never asked for details. I never asked what a second trimester abortion would do to my baby. And I would not seek the answers to that question for 15 years. You know, I once heard it said that what we do with our body, we do with our soul. When I could not or I, I did not seek that which was from above, when I could not set my sights on heaven, what was I left with? I was left with what the world had to offer. And I accepted what the world had to offer, not knowing that a day would come when I would ask myself how I could have allowed this to have been done to my baby. The abortion was the two-day procedure. It was not simple. After the abortion, I left the abortion facility. I vomited in the parking lot, and I rode home in silence. I carried nothing with me. You know, there was, there was no little body to bury. There was no doll-sized casket. There was no grave to adorn with flowers. My baby never got to smell her mother's skin. She never got to die warm and loved in my arms. There was no kiss goodbye. I imagine she was just discarded in some garbage bag along with the others that were aborted that day. In the days that followed, there were no cards of sympathy, no, one, no meals to be shared, no flowers, no one called because no one knew. I hadn't told anyone. Well, I have new questions these days. What could I say to someone? What could I show someone contemplating abortion? Could I tell them that the damage to their soul would require such intense healing that no one short of the Lord could heal the depth of that wound? Could I tell them that the pain of that decision would remain like a heavy weight until one day they would have to come to terms with it one way or another? Could I explain to them that, like me, one day they might be riding along in the car or sitting quietly at home, and all of a sudden they would remember that abortion facility? And they might recall that fluttering low on the left side, the movement of their unborn child. I rarely, if ever, thought about the abortion. I had secretly named my baby Melanie. I never spoke of her, though, and I never told anyone her name. The anniversary of her death would pass silently each year. After the abortion, I did as my doctor advised. I went home, and I tried not to look back. Along with Melanie, the memory of that abortion was buried in a grave so deep, I, I don't think I ever brought it to the forefront of my thinking. I mean, how, how could I? I became pregnant just two months later and delivered a son, and the years just raced by, and life marched on. Looking back, there were clear signs that the scars from my abortion existed, but I couldn't recognize them. I had repeated nightmares of running from something so horrible, so terrifying, that I would wake up in the middle of the night unable to go back to sleep. But when asked what I was afraid of, I did not know. I suffered from many things, but I never attributed them to my abortion because, after all, I had been told that abortion was safe, that I could leave it all behind me. I suffered from insomnia, 
repeated nightmares, anxiety, flashbacks, intense grief, relational problems. I couldn't stand to hear babies crying. I would have dreams of babies crying. I couldn't stand the sound of my own baby crying. And when he would wake up in the middle of the night, I would hand him to my husband, and I would run downstairs and lie on the couch in the fetal position with my hands over my ears. I couldn't stand the smell of lilacs. I would become nauseous. I had my abortion in May, and there were lilacs blooming outside of my bedroom window. I had flashbacks of the abortion facility recovery room, of hearing women crying because we were all lined up together, many women, many beds. Physically, I appeared healthy, but just below the surface, I was unusually fearful. And although I tried to keep my emotions under check, they would often emerge sudden and violent. I was at the Museum of Science and Industry once, and I, I passed a jar of formaldehyde in which a five-month-old preterm baby floated. And I just broke down, and I was inconsolable and embarrassed at my outburst. Well, sensing that something was not quite right, I tried counseling but quit. I walked away and I did what I'd always done. I buried my emotions, I set my jaw, and I just plowed forward. I tried God on for a time too, you know, almost like you would an article of clothing, you're know, sort of testing the fit. But life seemed to have just gotten in the way of all of that, and he seemed so incredibly far from me. And then one day, after 50 years of living far from God, far from God, after 15 years of suffering from my abortion, Christ just came rushing into my life, unsolicited by me, but riding on the prayers of two friends I would later find out had prayed for me for 20 years. There he was. He was waiting at the pasture gate, you know. Jesus, that sweet shepherd calling, he welcomed me, the lost lamb. He accepted me. And he came right into that abortion into the blood and the death and the shame and the devastation. And he said, you know what? I am king even here. I reign even here. Well, it was shortly after that that I happened to be home alone one day, and uh, I just sensed that Jesus wanted to show me something. And so I went to my computer, and I typed in second trimester abortion, but I just couldn't hit enter. And I said out loud to him, I said, why are you doing this to me? And I heard him say, deep in my heart, I want to heal you. I want to make you whole. And so I pressed enter, and this is what I learned. Because I was in my second trimester, my baby was too large to pull from my cervix using the suction device employed in first trimester abortions, and so my cervix needed to be dilated. Five narrow rods called laminaria were inserted into my cervix, and I was sent home to dilate. This took 24 hours. Once sufficient dilation had occurred, I went back to the abortion facility and was given general anesthesia. The abortionist then used forceps to rupture the amniotic sac. He then used forceps 
to grab whatever part of my baby he could, and he pulled her out by an arm or a leg, one piece at a time. My baby's skull was too large to pull from my cervix and had to be crushed for removal. The pieces of my dismembered baby were then reassembled on a tray to be sure all of her had been successfully removed. So it's, uh, it's really hard, you know? It's re really hard. I remember thinking, um, Melanie was sick, yes, but that didn't make her any less human. I remember thinking, I have broken the commandment, thou shalt not kill. I have collaborated with the doctors in the murder of my own child. I remember thinking, what a not so perfect baby Melanie could have meant to me and my family. What she might have meant to the world, you know, how she might have helped close the gap on that twisted thinking the one in which our present culture often uses to define what it sees as good enough to warrant keeping and what it sees as imperfect enough to throw away. John 8, 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the truth was the very beginning step of healing for me. You know, a person can't grieve for that which they don't allow themselves to feel. And likewise, I realized a person cannot repent from that which they don't know to be true. I had to be able to name what I had done. And so I asked my pastor if he would hear my confession and it was during confession, as I knelt before God, that I came to understand, truly understand, pardon me, that Jesus had come for me, you know, not the perfect, not the righteous, but the imperfect, the sinner, the wounded. And I knew that nothing, not even that abortion, could keep me from his love. And I knew that God is good. Jesus said, you are so tired. I will give you rest. I am forgiven and set free from an abortion that enslaved me, mind, body, and soul, for two decades. Because the tragedy of abortion is not the end of the story. Jesus comes right into it. He dispels all the lies. He just shatters them with his life-giving light. The definition of grace is pardon. It's mercy. He just poured his grace into me, and I was able to forgive not only myself, but the abortionist. Christ filled me with compassion for this man whose heart had been deceived and turned to stone. And I wanted to pray for him. I pitied him. And so I went to my church, and I knelt before that great wooden cross behind the altar of our Lord, and I prayed as Jesus did, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So how does he transform a life? How does he take something that was meant for evil and turn it into something for good? By acting in obedience to his will, he was able to change my life. I was able to say, God, I have loved you, and I have been obedient. And he asked me to be a voice for the voiceless and for the wounded, to share my story and his glory in it. 
In sacred scripture, Jesus commands us to serve who he calls the least of these. And so I ask, well, who are the least of these today? And I think about the unborn, so small, silent, defenseless, in their mother's womb. And I think surely the least of these gets no more least than these. Not long ago, I had another dream. And in the dream, I happened to glance down at my hands, and they were covered in blood. And I awoke panicked, and the memory of my aborted baby flashed through my mind. But you know what? It didn't take me but a few moments to recognize that dream as a lie, because my hands have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And I would just pray that he would grant you each faith enough to believe in his transforming power, courage to act and speak on behalf of the least of these, and obedience to his will in each one of your lives. All praise and glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless you.